say, uh, how many of you are more sort of lab-based, early-based translational research? E1 area, and then how about later phase, clinical research, B2, B4? Okay, so pretty evenly split. Good. Uh, you'll also notice that the title of this is a little different than what uh, was advertised, and I'll explain how these names are changing uh, over time. We, health services research is a uh, perhaps a broader net than patient-centered outcomes research in CER, and I'm going to talk about all these things today. So these are some disclosures that I um, provide. I'm not sure they'll be relevant here to uh, this presentation. So I want to uh, start off with some definitions, because I think the uh, Lewinsky community, <coughs> some of this is driven in part by, by politics of what is sort of in vogue, out of vogue, uh, what uh, the public is uh, perceived of as, as some of these different types of research and what um, uh, Congress and the bodies who fund this research uh, feel are, uh, are good names to use to avoid uh, misperceptions, perhaps. And then I'm going to give some examples. and. Uh, Examples will be from an area that I know something about, but hopefully they're uh, relevant in general to illustrate some of the, the opportunities and challenges in these types of uh, research studies. So if we think about the spectrum of, of clinical research, uh, normally when we talk about translational research, we're focused more on, uh, let's see if I can get the, I have to use this pointer right now, uh, more on sort of translation from bench to bedside, and that's the traditional idea of developing things in the lab and then maybe coming up with a drug or a technology and testing it out ultimately in humans. What I'm going to focus on today is a later stage of translational research, which really spans a different spectrum, and it goes from what some have said is sort of bedside into the community and the policy ultimately. and this is what we um, think about in terms of comparative effectiveness research and the latest sort of in vogue term uh, based on a funding source is patient-centered outcomes research. And health services research and epidemiology are the, the cornerstones, the science, the clinical science that constitute uh, these disciplines. So one of the things that has uh, uh, promulgated this area is PCORI. PCORI is the new non-government entity. It's, it's not a federal funding agency, but the money is from us. It's from insurance policies. Anytime somebody buys insurance, anytime somebody gets Medicare through the Affordable Health Care Act, the dollar of that policy goes into a trust fund which established the Corey. And the Corey will ultimately uh, have, I guess I left that slide out, but ultimately will have about $500 million a year for funding, and they've now had about eight to ten competitions across a variety of different topical areas, ranging from pragmatic clinical trials to things that are more focused on observational epidemiology, pharmacopoeia, risk communication. And we've had several of these grants here at UAB in the focus uh, of training. We've had um, one in lupus. Jazz Singh has developed one looking at a a tool to educate patients about their risk of uh, kidney disease with lupus, and um, Monica Sapper is this one before he went funded. So how does it all fit together? Uh, sort of in a, a series of overlapping Venn diagrams. You can see comparative effectiveness research, patient-centered outcomes research, HSR synonymous to some degree, and then pharmacoepidemiology, observational epidemiology. <laughs> focused on drug safety and effectiveness. So patient-centered outcomes research defined by PCORI should help people and caregivers communicate and make informed healthcare decisions so that their voices can be heard and we can assess healthcare options. And it needs to answer relevant questions given my characteristics, what should I expect will happen to me, what are my options, what can I do to improve the outcomes, how can clinicians in the care delivery system work to help me make the best decisions. One of the things that's, that's quite unique about writing to PCORI, if you are interested, 
and we have um, example applications. We have uh, several people in addition to the ones that have been funded that have actually submitted grants that haven't been funded, but we can learn from the good and the bad. And one of the things you have to do is you got to engage patients. And you have to engage patients early, not just for focus groups or for having them ultimately participate in the research, but they need to be investigators in the study. You need to figure out a way to directly engage the patients and ultimately pay them to be uh, part of your research team. Here's the slide I was looking for, which shows the funding level. And just to give you some sense, the other group that we work with a lot is the Agency for Healthcare Research and Quality, AHRQ, down here, which is part of HHS, where NIH sits. And their overall budget is just about the same as the Cori. So this is a fairly sizable undertaking. Now, we don't know what's going to happen to the Cori. Depends really on what happens ultimately to the Affordable Health Care Act. And these are the different areas that they've uh, been competing in, at least some of the first ones, assessing prevention, diagnosis, and treatment, improving health care systems, communication, and dissemination, disparities, and methods research. Uh, Pete Fung Yoon, who works with us in uh, epi and rheumatology, just sent in a grant, a methods grant, looking at using um, methods of imputation to figure out missing data when measuring patient reported outcomes. So that's the kind of thing that they, uh, we hope will have an interest in. Now, one of the things that's come out of PCORI is something called PCORINET. PCORINET is a set of clinical data research networks and patient-powered research networks. There's about 10 CDRNs and about 8 PPRNs. UAB is part of a PPRN. Jeff Curtis, who works with us, is um, collaborating with a group called the Global Healthy Living Foundation, Creaky Points, Creaky Bones is the, uh, the affectionate name. And they are uh, actually a, a social media site for patients with arthritis to go and learn about things. And now we're using that as a way to actually collect data and to link patients to things like Medicare data and other uh, EHR type data sources within uh, the Vanderbilt Clinical Data Research Network for starters, and to then bring those people all together. And the goal is through minimal data resource uh, sets like uh, I2B2 and OMAP and uh, distributed data model used by the HMO Research Network and the FDA Mini Sentinel activity, figure out a way that nationally we can start to better combine data sources. That's really the goal of all this is how do we do a better job nationally at uh, sharing data and answering big research questions. So CER got a big jump start with the uh, ERA monies, the, uh, the stimulus funds. There was about a billion dollars committed to this. Thankfully, UAV received a, uh, a sizable number of grants from this, including a supplement we had to our CTSA grant here. And CER is really looking at what works in the real world. And this was an IOM report that, that followed that. So the broad definitions, and this is taken from a training grant that we actually wrote to HRQ, where they were asking us to address some of these different domains and training around CER for K-12 scholars. Longitudinal studies of effectiveness of therapeutics, real-world clinical trials, the other term used is pragmatic clinical trials, evidence implementation, risk communication, and pharmacoeconomics, methods innovations, and systematic reviews. And all of these things are going on here. There's people at UAB that are involved in all these different kinds of research activities. I like this slide, uh, stole it from a colleague, and um, it sort of helps us think about how this all fits together. So we can start off with generating evidence, either in interventional or observational studies. We can synthesize that evidence via systematic reviews and that analyses. Ultimately, we need guidelines and economic analyses to figure out how to utilize this information. The next step then is to develop performance measures, quality indicators. What is the minimal acceptable standard of care that we would consider reasonable at a population level? And then we really get into what historically has been the domain of health services research, looking at practice pattern variation. And the pivotal work was back with uh, Weinberg and colleagues looking at variations in the rate of hysterectomy in different places in the U.S. and showing these dramatic differences in the number of people that were getting this procedure. 
suggesting that something was different. It probably wasn't the patient mix, but likely the, the uh, clinicians uh, and their practice pattern. So ultimately, how do we translate research into practice? How do we disseminate the evidence? And there's lots of examples of the very long lag time between when something is established as this proven scientific value to when it actually is widely implemented throughout the country. I'm going to give some examples, and we'll start with uh, some observational epi. Quote, from Archie Cochran, the father of modern meta-analysis, be delightfully surprised when any treatment at all is effective. Always assume a treatment is ineffective unless there's evidence to the contrary. Probably fairly good general advice for all the clinicians in the crowd. So here's a, a drug, a steroid, glucocorticoids, that are widely used, about a half to one percent of the population is using these drugs at any given time, and this just shows a few of the diseases for which these drugs might be prescribed. Uh, many are in the rheumatology space, but emphysema, asthma, inflammatory bowel disease, also very common indication. This was based on data from a large managed care organization that we partnered with and were able to access their data and look at the indications uh, for chronic glucocorticoid prescription. What we were also interested in is not just what the diseases were, but who were the physicians who were doing the prescribing. And this had relevance in thinking about efforts aimed at trying to improve the safer use of these drugs. And while we thought it would be mostly specialists who were doing the prescribing, at least among the chronic users, it turns out that it was mostly the generalists. So that had some, some um, ramifications for a study we subsequently designed. And we found in this study now quite a while ago, looking at a retrospective cohort where we identified rheumatoid arthritis patients, found out their use of steroids, and then had a um, age, sex, and um, disease duration matched group of non-users. We looked at all the different outcomes that might occur as side effects of steroids. Fractures were one that we were particularly concerned about, and indeed that was one that was described most commonly. We looked at it a little bit further in this retrospective cohort and saw that if you didn't take prednisone at five years of follow-up, you had about a 20% chance of having one of the bad outcomes that were listed in the last slide, compared with the nearly 80% chance if you were taking between 10 and 15 milligrams a day of prednisone. So it suggested some uh, dose response, one of the criteria we use in considering there may be a relationship and that it, something could potentially be causally linked. We then looked at a multivariable approach and used logistic regression analysis to understand whether there appeared to be an independent effect of glucocorticoid dose, here again shown distributed by uh, the milligram exposure to prednisone, and now accounting analytically for things like rheumatoid nodules, presence of um, erosions of the bone, a marker of more severe rheumatoid arthritis, and curiously a couple of other things that we didn't hypothesize would have been associated. This was a group of patients in Iowa, so the idea of being a farmer laborer, curiously, was a risk factor that we didn't anticipate. So we saw a very strong dose response with the ultimate uh, effect of a 30-fold increased risk of developing a bad outcome if you were taking a higher dose of prednisone. Now, so that's an observational way to look at a, a safety concern with the drug. What are some of the problems here? Well, in this case, uh, many of the studies that have answered this question have been retrospective or under control, at least this had a control group. But we have a problem in observational epidemiology, and that's confounding by indication. The people who get assigned to a particular therapy are not given that drug randomly. They're given that drug because their clinicians are concerned that they may have a bad outcome and that they think this may provide a benefit. So this issue of uh, selection bias, whereby sicker patients are treated more aggressively, is the big challenge in doing therapeutic epidemiology. There's also a problem in cohort studies of detection bias. We don't follow patients in a systematic way. We see them as they come into the clinic. And if somebody, if you're worried about somebody more because you're, you think they may fracture their bones because they're on a high dose of prednisone, 
you may see it more and you may x-ray it more. So you may be more likely to detect something that you might otherwise miss. So that's a detection bias that also plagues this type of study. Therapy is being on at variable points in the disease course, and then also in this setting, the data may get extrapolated. So can randomized controlled trials fix the biases of the observational studies, this type of an observational study, to address this question? But one of the problems is sample size. And when you're looking at uh, outcomes that are even modestly common, you need fairly sizable numbers. So if you're, for example, looking in this example, uh, at having a 10% rate of the bad outcome in those not exposed to steroids and a 15% rate in those who got steroids. In other words, you wanted to pick up an odds ratio of 1.5, you would need over a thousand individuals. And there's been no study, no clinical trial in this area that's got that type of sample size. So that's a real problem. And that's why traditional clinical trials, phase three clinical trials that are done for drug development and for drug approval, are traditionally underpowered to answer questions about safety. They usually don't have big sample sizes. And for rare events, events less than one in 100, but they may be very serious events that, even if they're that rare, may still be of clinical relevance if millions of people are taking the medicines, ultimately. You often need to still rely, to some degree, on observational studies. And the FDA has uh, certainly gotten a bad rap over all this. Uh, there's been some um, call for using other resources. Can we, uh, from this uh, distinguished lay publication, as they suggest, can we passively figure this out by studying databases of large insurers? So we've been interested in that. And there's a number of investigators here at UAB that have spent a lot of time gaining expertise in working with large data sets. Medicare, Medicaid, large databases from the private sector, IMS data, we worked a lot with Kaiser, with United Healthcare, with Aetna, uh, some with Blue Cross, that is a little more challenging for a variety of reasons. But, um, so, so here's another example. This is from uh, another class of medicines. These are medicines that inhibit um, pro-inflammatory cytokines, the tumor necrosis factor, uh, a molecule in particular, and there's a group of agents now called uh, tumor necrosis factor inhibitors that were developed uh, about 15 to 20 years ago, and they've been very efficacious in a variety of inflammatory conditions like rheumatoid arthritis and psoriasis. You see them advertised on TV, so you can figure that these drugs are uh, very expensive, first of all, because they make a lot of money and they can afford to advertise on, uh, on TV. But um, one of the things that's been interesting is there are concerns about some rare side effects, particularly infections and, and other bad outcomes that might associate with the use of these drugs. But similar to the last example, is it the drug or is it the underlying condition for which the drug is being given that leads to these bad outcomes? People that have rheumatoid arthritis, have altered immune response, and they may be at risk just on the basis of their disease alone for developing infections or subsequent, particularly hematologic malignancy. So that's the question that we sought to answer using large data. And in this example, we used United Healthcare data. United Healthcare is a large managed care organization with link longitudinal databases. You can see the statistics on the number of patients that were available for the, uh, the study we conducted. It shows a few of the areas in the country. So some generalizability, although not optimal, not diffuse throughout the U.S., but this was more a, uh, an opportunity to work with a group that had large data. One of the advantages of working with managed care organizations is that typically the pharmacy benefits are part of it. So not only do you have the administrative claims around who gets care and where are the uh, billing codes generated around particular clinical encounters, which is very helpful in being able to pick up signals of possible outcomes of interest, but you also have a linkage to the drug data, whereas in most of our fee-for-service systems, in Alabama, for example, where we're about 80 to 90 percent Blue Cross in the private sector, we don't have that linkage. People go out and get their drugs at CVS, Walgreens, or wherever, and we don't have a way to systematically capture that as you would if you were part of United Healthcare. 
So observational studies based on administrative claims, data that's generated for billing purposes, includes these health plans with millions of people. They provide the services. We get diagnostic codes, ICD-9 codes, procedure codes, CPT codes, and now the pharmacy data, which is also enriched. And then all of that is maintained centrally by these organizations. Many of them have research arms that are focused on this, and that information can be very helpful in doing population-based research. We have a group that's part of our outcome center, and it's called the PEER Group, the Pharmacoepidemiology Economics Research Group. It's a spin-off of PEER, led by Meredith Kilgore and Jeff Curtis, and now Paul Muttner and Monica Safford also play major roles. And within PEER, this is actually a little bit outdated. We actually have a full Medicare sample now, and beyond the 5% sample, but we have the full Medicare uh, data set. Working with Medicare data is very complex. The files are huge. It um, comes to you in a, a very odd way. Getting the data is very complex. You have to go through a vendor called ResDAC where you have to apply to get the data, filling out the application. If you don't have experience doing this, or being uh, very involved. And we have some people here that have expertise in doing that. Uh, and the other curious thing, you would think since this is a federal program that it ought to be free or very cheap. It's actually very expensive. And even worse is that once you get the data, you have that data to use only for a very specific indication, for a very particular research question. If you want to ask another question with that data, you have to reapply. You can keep the data, but you have to reapply and you have to pay more money to, to use the data for a second question. Medicaid data is also a great source, and there's several investigators uh, here at UAB, uh, Janet Bronstein in the School of Public Health, Tim Buechelman in pediatrics and pediatric rheumatology, all of them have um, done some really nice things with Medicaid data. A challenge with Medicaid data is that when you've worked with one state's Medicaid data, you've worked with one state's Medicaid data. Each state is a little bit different. So trying to combine this data and look across states is very complicated as well. So these are great sources. Uh, another great source is the VA. How many are affiliated with the VA? VA connections? Yeah. So VA data probably is the single best, most organized data source we have. The problem is the generalizability. We're dealing with mostly men and people with uh, somewhat different socioeconomic statuses. And, um, and the VA has got its own uh, protocols in terms of getting access to the data and actually learning to work with that data. So back to the question of um, the safety of these new uh, anti-inflammatories, these anti-TNFs. And this was the black box warning that it appeared around one of these drugs, suggesting that lymphoma and other malignancies were a concern, particularly in children. So Tim Buchelman was interested in this because uh, he wanted to understand more what the real population-based risks were for, for juvenile arthritis patients. And he used national Medicaid data and he compared malignancy rates for different treatments for juvenile inflammatory arthritis. This is what he found looking at the standardized incidence rates for all malignancy, reported as uh, uh, here in the right column. So for all juvenile arthritis, about a fourfold increased risk. Now, this is another commonly used drug, methotrexate, so if you used either methotrexate or a tumor necrosis factor, I'm sorry, if you didn't use either of these, there was a greater risk. These were probably kids who might have had more severe disease and for some reason weren't good candidates. But with just methotrexate alone or with any anti-tumor necrosis factor, you can see the rates here. And the confidence bands for methotrexate are, are no longer significant, but there weren't any reports at all of developing malignancy, particularly hematologic malignancy, with the tumor necrosis factor inhibitors. So that was an important um, finding and one that led to uh, some high visibility publications. We've had some other papers looking at infections with these drugs, the JAMA paper, looking at uh, zoster vaccination, and, um, and, and more with um, infections as well. So this has been an area that we've been working on for a while. And another point to make is that it's really teamwork. It involves working with people across the institution that have different expertise levels in different areas, epidemiologists, biostatisticians, clinicians, 
but also working across centers. And in this bottom paper, we had investigators from Vanderbilt, from uh, the Kaiser System, from uh, Brigham and Women's Hospital, who brought data in from the University of Pennsylvania. So this is truly team science to do this type of work with uh, having the numbers that you need when you're looking at relatively rare events and being able to concatenate data across multiple different systems. So what can this type of data do? What can administrative data, data that we collect primarily for billing purposes, how can it be useful? Well, we can use large national data sets with fewer selection biases. It provides good generalizability. And best is it can complement other approaches. If you can link administrative data to registries, to cohorts, we have large national cohorts at UAB. The REGARD study, for example, on stroke has been linked to Medicare data, cardiac, it's another large cohort that has possible data linkages. So the ability to link data provides a tremendous resource with administrative data. What can't we do with administrative data? First, we can't provide accurate classification of disease states. So there's the potential for miscoding and misclassification. This is a real big problem. And you often have to go and validate algorithms using the administrative data to be sure that you're really defining things appropriately. In the case of diseases like rheumatoid arthritis, where things like the number of swollen joints or the health-related quality of life are very important in assessing the disease activity and potentially the disease severity, that can be another missing link. And that's where having a registry with a linkage to the follow-up of administrative data can be very helpful. Differentiating incident from prevalent outcomes can be prob problematic, and uh, we don't have detailed information always on comorbidities. So these are challenges of using administrative data alone. So it brings us back to randomized controlled trials. Can we rely on randomized controlled trials? Do they answer all of our questions where we no longer have just uh, observational methods, but we assign people by chance to a particular treatment state? And here's two um, experts who tell us that we really should rely just on our CTs. If we find a study that was not randomized, we suggest you stop reading and go to the next article. Uh, we need, and then Feinstein in uh, his book says we need both. <coughs> and we don't get, can't get the experts to agree. <coughs> this is uh, John Iannatis. He's been a little bit of a heretic. Uh, he says that if you think about what's actually true, what is the truth, and you rely on large, adequately powered, randomized controlled trials, you've got an 85% likelihood of finding the truth versus meta-analyses, which is 40%. And he argues that even large, well-done epi studies only have a 20% chance of being accurate. Now, we'll argue in a second about whether they're really well done. That's the real key. So in support of observational studies, is that a well-designed observational study does not systematically overestimate the magnitude of the effects based on one uh, investigation. And there's little evidence that the effects of observational studies were consistently larger or qualitatively different from other RCTs in another uh, perspective article also published in MDJM. The classic example that's often used is that of hormone replacement therapy, the Women's Health Initiative finding, that we had all these tremendous observational studies showing that hormones prevented heart disease. And then when we finally did the randomized controlled trial in the setting of Women's Health Initiative, it looked, we found the opposite, that there was an increased risk. Well. Um, Michelle Hernanen had gone back and done a very carefully conducted observational study using marginal structural modeling, a very sophisticated attempt to control for confounding by indication, and in fact found the same thing going back to the earlier observational study. So it may not have been that the studies were that well done, and there may have been significant confounding that led to that conclusion. Bottom line is, is I don't think it's fair to compare good RCTs with bad observational studies. We need to improve our observational studies. We need to do better observational studies with more careful inclusion, exclusion, and we need to validate our endpoints. Now, that said, um, we've had a lot of intrigue and a lot of activity at UAB in the area of real world or pragmatic clinical trials. Now, when we think about drug development, early preclinical work, uh, some of you may be engaged in. We have Southern Research Institute here in town, and they're engaged in, in early phase work. A lot of that goes on in our cancer center. 
Phase one is uh, testing uh, in healthy volunteers. Phase two is dose ranging, trying to figure out does the drug have preliminary efficacy, does it work uh, in people with the disease. And then phase three is the pivotal study that is required for drug approval. Usually uh, hundreds if not thousands of patients and uh, here you get the answer to the question, does it work? Does it work in a controlled setting? Phase four is where we've been focusing so far today, and that is what happens after the drug is out, and can we assess uh, rare events? Are there safety worries that we didn't pick up in the earlier phases? So why do we need more and new and better clinical trials? Historically, most trials have compared drugs and devices to placebo, and this answers an interesting question, but doesn't really tell us how they compare with one another. We're trying to make decisions about choosing for particular patients. That's often a problem. And most of the studies that are designed are designed as superiority studies. Does something work better than placebo, typically? But is, what if something's just not, as, not any worse than another drug? A non-inferiority design may be appropriate. Not all questions can be answered by traditional clinical trials, and traditional clinical trials are typically very expensive and very inefficient. This just gives you a sense of the, the price tag of doing these, uh, the mean cost for uh, developing a drug, uh, quite staggering, and this goes up each year. The cost of conducting trials, uh, very high. Most of the burden is borne by the U.S., and there's often uh, significant delays. Moreover, the doctors that participate in conducting the clinical trials are not particularly representative. There's a select pool of physicians and uh, healthcare groups in the U.S. that do these studies, so they don't really represent what goes on in uh, rural communities and, and other populations of patients. So that when many drugs come out on the market, we don't really know what they're going to do in a group that hasn't been carefully studied based on these limited phase three investigations. Why don't more clinicians do clinical trials? What are the barriers for participating? How many have been involved in clinical trials? So quite a few. And um, you know, we, we have been very interested in trying to get physicians in the community to participate, those that haven't done it. Why don't they like to do it? I don't have time. I don't have an efficient way to recruit patients. I don't have the critical mass of the study staff. I can't collect the specimens in my office. It doesn't pay well enough. Uh, just just converting to an EMR and I can't be bothered with anything else. Perhaps the barriers can be lessened. Is there something we can do to make it easier? And one of the ways we can do this is to think about pragmatic trials, also known as large simple trials, although the terms are not entirely synonymous. A trial can be large and simple, but not terribly pragmatic. So the traditional RCT has great internal validity. It's very carefully designed but it has very poor generalizability. A large, simple, or pragmatic trial has lower validity, but much higher generalizability. If you look at this picture from the Fletcher Fletcher Epi book and just think about the differences, so we're looking at real-world effectiveness, large samples, minimal inclusion, low risk, and objective, simple, natural endpoints. How simple is simple? Simplest is just looking at do people live or die. That's the easiest, but a lot of disease states that doesn't relate to very well. We want to collect less data. We want to leverage the epidemiology study designs, particularly can we link people to other data that may exist for other reasons. So explanatory studies, traditional studies, ascertain whether a new treatment possesses the favorable activity in man which laboratory studies have led us to suspect. Can it work under ideal circumstances? This is an efficacy trial, a traditional phase three clinical trial. Pragmatic or large simple trials assess the practical value of a new treatment in relationship to other existing treatments. Does it work under usual circumstances? These are effectiveness studies, efficacy in the experimental setting, effectiveness in the real world. And it's not a dichotomy, as you might expect. It's not explanatory versus pragmatic. Take um, the example of patient compliance. The most explanatory would be to require that uh, people be compliant before the RCT starts. You might have a run-in period. 
Uh, you could apply compliance improving strategies to everyone. You might monitor compliance and intervene if it was low. You might monitor it only or you might, in a very pragmatic study, ignore it completely. That would be the most pragmatic of all designs. And Thorpe has suggested a continuum across many different dimensions, from uh, the flexibility to the practitioner expertise to the uh, follow-up intensity, the outcomes. These, you can then create spider diagrams, and uh, you can actually compare the uh, dimensions of whether a study is explanatory or pragmatic. Now, if you write a grant to PCORI, if you write a pragmatic clinical trial grant, you need to show this, actually. You need to show where your study fits in across these different dimensions. So here's a famous pragmatic trial all had. This was the antihypertensive and lipid-lowering treatment to prevent heart attack study. Uh, looked at the old diuretics, and it compared them with more costly blood pressure-lowering drugs. Eight-year study, NHLBI funded it. UAB did great, contributed a lot of patients. 42,000 patients overall, very large study, $125 million. Now, that is not a, uh, that's a showstopper in NIH these days, given the budgets. So the big problem is the cost. How do we bring the cost down of doing these pragmatic studies? How do we engage more representative participants and busy clinicians? How do we collect data efficiently and navigate all the complex regulatory requirements across multiple institutions. So we put together a group of stakeholders, which included patients and physicians and members of practice-based research networks and clinical trial researchers. We had some people from the government and from the payers, uh, the, the funding agencies and the insurance companies. And we thought about the study across different stages, from recruitment to outcome assessment, and thought about a few things that might help improve things. First of all, could we leverage practices that are part of networks? And that's becoming easier and easier as there's more practice-based research networks and now with the CoreNet and the Clinical Data Research Networks, a lot of groups are working together. Could we use internet technology to improve the consent process and to hopefully make the study more efficient and easier to do in the clinic? And also improve comprehension of the consent process, which is a barrier overall. And perhaps the, the most significant innovation we were interested in is could we reduce the cost in certain diseases by linking patients to their administrative data? So if you randomize a large group of patients, but then instead of having them come back into the clinic to be followed up, why not just measure their outcomes and claims data that's collected for billing purposes? So the study we've designed and that we're uh, working on trying to get funded either through BCORI and or the NIH is called EDGE. And it answers a question about bisphosphonates, the most commonly used medicine in osteoporosis. The question that exists now is how long do you need to stay on these medicines? These are drugs that are very efficacious for reducing fracture risk. Yet there's now that the drugs have been on the market for 20 years, there's no question circulating about their long-term safety. Could they lead to a greater number of odd outcomes, problems with the jaw, problems with weird fractures developing after you've been on the medicine for a long period of time? And so we've been looking at different data sources for our study, looking at claims, using surveys, and relying on, on medical records. Uh, we've been working with uh, networks of physicians that already exist. Uh, DartNet is a large group of family physicians, as is StarNet. Uh, and uh, the Alabama Practice Research Network is another group that exists regionally. We've also partnered with a, a vendor that uh, has developed an uh, e-consent form uh, called Mitris, and that, that has been a very mm -hmm. successful collaboration. Let me show an example of our collaboration with Mitris. We've developed an iPad application for doing informed consent. This is the entry screen that provides an introduction. They, they say that looks like me. I don't think so. But, uh, and then they get a animation of the study design with avatars that describe the study. In this case, they're either going to continue their medicine or they're going to stop their medicine. After they've been on it for at least three years, they get quizzed 
during the consent process to assess their understanding. If they do particularly poorly, the investigator could say, well, you just don't get it. You can't be in the study. I'm not going <laughs> to let you be part of this because you don't understand what we're doing. This is a pretty simple study. Not very complicated in terms of what they have to do. So most people were quite good at this. And then they can e consent. They can sign the consent form. We can send it to them electronically, which has been approved by central IRBs and by the UAB IRB, or they can print it out in the clinic and give them a copy there. Now, the key to all clinical trials is recruitment. I mean, I'm trying to figure out ways to identify the population, to get them engaged and interested in the question, developing your materials, your flyers, your logos. All this takes a lot of time and a lot of expertise that most of us have not really been trained in, but we can work with colleagues that, that have some expertise and even with graphic designers to develop materials. This just tells you a little bit more about the study. There's a website, talks about what it involved, what's involved if you're one of the clinicians participating. What the clinicians want to know is this, <clears throat> how much are they going to get paid? What's the capitated rate of payment? And in a study like this, you've got it capitated very heavily because we don't really know how successful doctors and clinicians are going to be in recruiting. Maybe that they think they can do really well, but when it actually gets down to it, they don't have many patients that qualify or they don't succeed. We want to be able to switch those resources between site to avoid uh, spending money on sites that aren't being successful. <clears throat> Partnering with uh, groups like the HMO Research Network, which includes the Kaisers, can be quite helpful. They have huge numbers of patients in their databases. Here's over 25,000 patients that appear to qualify for our study. This has been a rich resource for us. Why should people participate? <laughs> One of the goals in, um, in this whole activity is to think about a learning healthcare environment. And this has been uh, put forward by the Institute of Medicine. This is an ethical framework suggested by Hayden and Cass that it's a moral priority for us to contribute to the learning healthcare system, but it's also a priority and a moral obligation for patients. They should, uh, through the principle of common good, want to contribute their data and want to be part of, of studies like this. UAB has uh, been collaborating with other groups through other projects that are listed here, just suggesting that it is about a learning healthcare environment, and we're working hard through our health system to create a universal consent form so that when a patient comes in to the clinic, for example, and uh, agrees to be seen, they would sign a consent, potentially allowing us to recontact them. They would agree to allow their unused biospecimens to be stored. That would be another value in part of a learning healthcare system, having a biobank of specimens, all things that other institutions, and hopefully soon, we will be doing as well. Talk for a minute about evidence implementation, and uh, this goes back to another paradigm developed by some colleagues at UAB now, uh, some at UMass and, and Vanderbilt, but if we think again about uh, the early phase translation, basic science to clinical trials, Implementation research is this later stage. How do we get the evidence out into practice? And outcomes research suggests that it's not geography or ethnicity or variations that should predict uh, patient outcomes, but the values and preferences should be incorporated into decision making. Elizabeth, Elizabeth McGuinn, in a paper widely quoted from a number of years back now, showed us that adults were not doing very well in the U.S. So if you looked across a number of standard preventive therapies and indicators of quality, we were only succeeding nationally in about half of those overall. And this is really the problem. We learn that something works very early on, and then as time progresses, you see the challenges in trying to translate that into practice. So here's a beta blocker, which uh, was very successful in an animal model, and then eventually clinical trial shows that it works. Where did it actually start to get endorsed? Well, it's, it takes 20 years before the National uh, Committee on Quality Assurance actually has a quality indicator 
and just recently retired the quality indicator because now over 90% of people that have a heart attack are receiving the beta blockers. So no longer necessary to even measure it, but over a 20 year period, that's a little bit too long. So healthcare problems are serious and extensive. They include underuse, overuse, and misuse. The most common area for evidence implementation has been an underuse. This has been the traditional focus of quality improvement. Here's one example of audit feedback. This shows uh, us compared to other hospitals in the U.S. Here's the average reporting hospitals on the percent of pneumonia patients that give, get given an initial antibiotic within four hours of their arrival. Here's the average in the state, and here's how UAB at the time was doing. And we've proven this. This is more than 10 years ago. But when we see data like this, this is very motivational, very motivational to our administrators to improve. We don't like to look like this. So audit feedback can be a very valuable and very potent way to, to change our behavior collectively. We are all very competitive in the healthcare field, but we want to do a better job at least as well, if not better, than our colleagues. The new thing now is not so much underuse, but overuse. And many groups throughout the country, including the American um, College of Physicians and the American um, Board of Internal Medicine, have come together with top five lists. What are the five things in your particular medical area that have the lowest value? And a lot of groups have now published their list in the Annals of Internal Medicine. This is the top five list uh, that has been put forward. So measuring quality is not easy, and it can be defined as health services for individuals and populations that increase the likelihood of desired health outcomes that are consistent with current professional knowledge. And different dimensions of quality include efficacy, equity, efficiency, safety, timeliness, and patient-centeredness. Developing quality indicators is a process whereby we can take a guideline, we can convert that into a quality metric, and then we can actually measure that. And implementation research seeks to uh, study the methods to promote rapid uptake of these research findings and to reduce inappropriate care and improve the health of individuals and populations. So implementation research is at the intersection between Research and quality improvement. It uses methods from health services research and qualitative methods to translate science beyond the bedside. So knowledge translation, quality improvement is the degree to which interventions increase the likelihood of the desired outcome, although overuse and misuse exist. The fundamental problem has been underuse, and that's been where the traditional focus has been. Why do we fail to implement it in healthcare? Lots of different reasons. Physicians, patients, systems, poorly aligned incentives all significantly contribute to failed implementation. What are some of the ways that we can address this? Uh, we can develop printed materials that we pass out in the waiting room or in the exam room. It doesn't work. We can do traditional continuing education of clinicians in practice. They get smarter, but they don't change their behavior. We can do intensive conferencing. This works great for things like smoking cessation. The problem is it takes a lot of time and very resource intensive. You can use computerized tools. You go over to the VA or even in the REHR now at UAB, you see all these pop-ups and warnings and reminders. People have figured out how to turn all those off. So those have become less helpful. Outreach visits, academic detailing. Opinion leaders go out into the community to meet with clinicians tell them how they do, and that can help, but very, very expensive to do. And then audit and feedback. I gave an example of that already. I'll give another one in just a minute. Ultimately, a multifaceted approach, a multimodal approach that use different approaches, different levers to try to address the barriers and facilitators. Here's an example from um, my colleagues, Jerome Allison and Katerina Kipo, when they were in our section of preventive medicine. Now they're up at UMass, and they we're very instrumental in developing something called the Achievable Benchmark of Care. This was a type of audit feedback where patients uh, or doctors were actually compared against performance, not only at a, a statewide level, but at a benchmark level defined as the top 10% of their colleagues. And you can see a report card for a given physician looking at their 
performance and creatinine measurement, uh, triglycerides, cholesterol, et cetera, for things that we ought to be concerned about when we're taking care of patients with diabetes. So this is what a report card for a given clinician might look like. And they showed that these achievable benchmarks actually improve performance, more so than what had been used traditionally by the uh, uh, quality improvement organizations prior to that time. We were interested in this in the setting of steroid-induced osteoporosis, where we know that these medicines, these prednisone and steroid medicines, are bad for bone. We could see that there was a large proportion of patients, even though there have been some temporal improvements within that in the healthcare system over a, uh, a decade or so. We saw, though, that still over 40% of women at highest risk were not getting treated. And among younger women and men, the numbers were even much worse. So we designed a randomized control trial to try to improve quality. We identified the high-risk steroid users within the Aetna Health System. We figured out who their doctors were. We uh, identified those doctors and then offered them a clinical uh, quality improvement program on the internet. We needed 150. We got 150. They were randomized either to a control state or to an intervention. At baseline, we assessed the rate of testing and treatment among these physicians' patients, and then we followed this up subsequent to the intervention. What was the intervention? It included tailored case-based learning using principles of adult learning. It was interactive. We had the achievable benchmark of care in there. We had an improvement toolbox. They could download material and hand this out in their clinics. They could get CME, and it was rolled out over a six-month period to combat any decay. Here's what we found. In the intent to treat analysis, the primary analysis of the study, we didn't see any benefit. There was no significant difference. If we looked at the doctors that did what we asked, those who went online, downloaded their materials, and did all the cases, there started to be some trends towards some increased testing and some increased treatment. So it suggested to us that for some disease states, a busy clinician might not be the right target we're trying to improve quality. But maybe we needed to rely not so much on the physician and provider, but think about approaches aimed at the healthcare system and perhaps directly at the patient. So one approach involves narrative communication, the idea of storytelling, uh, trying to find people who can relay a message to another person using homophily, the idea that we recognize similarities in people's experiences and their demographic and other characteristics, and we can relate to them. It's the idea of watching a, a commercial on TV that captivates you. The power of narratives to change belief has never been doubted and has always been feared. So storytelling uh, may be considered brainwashing, if you will, but hopefully for a good purpose. Here's an example that um, uh, Jerome Allison and Tom Houston published just before going up to UMass, and this was over at the Cooper Green Hospital. They uh, identified a group of uh, predominantly African-American men who had hypertension. They developed a very grainy uh, home movie style video that they had, had them watch in the waiting room. And it talked about what it was like to have a stroke and other problems of not taking your blood pressure medicine. And they found a significant reduction in the, uh, the blood pressure between those who uh, were in the intervention versus the control arm, particularly among those that had the worst blood pressure to start with. We've done a similar thing in our steroid-induced osteoporosis population. We're uh, currently um, waiting on one result and, and have one in. It's, it's difficult to nudge behavior, even with approaches that, that target patients. And so I wanted to show you and conclude with one final example, which we consider more of a health <coughs> system intervention. And this was within two of the Kaiser systems. We worked with Kaiser Northwest and we worked with Kaiser of Georgia. And we looked at a, a very low-tech approach. So we found a number of women within these two systems who were of the age where they should have had a bone density test. We randomized the women to either the usual care, where they would just get this at the discretion of their clinician, or to receive a, a, the ability to self-refer. 1-800 number, call the 1-800 number, schedule your own bone density test. And we saw about a 20 to 30 percent increase in the rate of bone density utilization and, and receipt with this very low-tech approach across the two systems, slightly less so in 
Kaiser of Georgia than in Kaiser Northwest, but still a significant difference from what we saw with usual care. So evidence implementation research is a, a challenging area. It uh, is first necessary to know what is quality in a particular area. How do we increase quality? We have to work with a team of investigators who have expertise in behavioral science and epidemiology and the clinical question. And implementing evidence at the community level is not at all easy. The technology can offer promises. Theory-based creativity is key. And generally, one size fits none. We're trying to design the right intervention that's going to be efficacious and ultimately effective is, is quite a challenge. You've got to test your approaches. And this is a very uh, important slide in a, an interesting study that uh, suggests that, yeah, if you do traditional quality improvement, generally looks pretty good if you don't have a control. 80% of the time, things get better. But when you actually control it, the opposite conclusion. A lot of these things don't work. And that's why doing these experiments, we believe, is very important in figuring out what, what is it that's actually leading to a difference. Uh, I want to just mention a couple other things that tie into this, and that's uh, ethnic and racial disparities. We've been interested in this across the, uh, the spectrum of musculoskeletal diseases, looking at anti-inflammatory drugs and finding significant healthcare disparities here uh, with risk communication being an issue across this and a uh, paper, uh, actually a perspective from a study we did that had been done by one of our uh, former fellows, uh, Rachel Fry, and uh, the president of the American College of Rheumatology commented on this in a, uh, a post in one of our uh, newsletters. So uh, I think David will stop here, and I'm delighted to take some um, questions. Uh, I don't think... Um, I don't have anything else that I plan to, to cover, but I would be delighted to, uh, to hear about some of your experiences and questions that you have as it relates to research that you're considering. I think there's a really great opportunity here at UAB to, uh, to get involved in some of this. Let me see if I have I left off the, uh, uh, the slides on our training program. Let me just mention that uh, we have a T32 in health services research. If any of you are in the postdoc stage, there is um, uh, several, several slots typically available each year, and uh, we have an application and a competition for that. It's joint with our VA Quality Scholars Program. And then perhaps of relevance to, uh, to those of you uh, who I know uh, better, the, uh, the K-12. We have a K-12 in patient-centered options research. We're actually just reviewing the applications for that right now, uh, we have three slots available a year, which is a two-year K-level uh, program. We hope, depending on the, uh, the final decision on the CTSA, we hope we'll have slots for the KL2 within the CTSA, and uh, those will be not only for people doing later stage translational research, but early stage translational research as well. So stay tuned on that. But this is a great way to help protect your time and to uh, buy some time either before getting an extramural K award or even prior to submitting an R level grant to, uh, to give you mentored research time and uh, allow you to participate in some of the didactic things that may be helpful if you haven't done it already at the School of Public Health as well as some of the enriching things like, um, like this program and others that we offer. Uh, Something you might just want to be aware of in your interactions with younger career students, too, if we, we, we have pretty positive feedback on the CPSA renewal application at this point, but we won't know exactly what's funded for a couple months, probably. But one of the programs that we, has, we hope will be funded is a TL1 program, which is aimed at um, students in professional degree programs, so medical students, dental students, nursing students pharmacy students um, that will give them either a summer in comparative effectiveness research or a full year off master's program uh, that they might be interested in. So if you encounter students at a point in their pre-professional training um, that might benefit from this too, just be aware of that and try to direct them in the right place. Yeah. And, um, you know, the goal of all these is just to grow the pool of people at UAB that are doing these kinds of things. We 
in addition, you have some resources through the Department of Medicine, but also uh, through the school to do targeted recruitment. If you're growing research programs and are looking to recruit people doing outcomes and effectiveness research, we're loaded to talk about that. And, and again, I think it's really great that there's um, the peer group now working with large data. They are open to discussions around particular research questions. CORE is uh, the university-wide interdisciplinary research center that supports the, the training grants. We bring visiting professors in. We have the works in progress, which occur between uh, CORE, Lister Hill Center, and then our search program funded by HRQ. Those rotate, and the topics uh, are mostly people developing grant ideas, but we bring professors to talk about things. We had uh, Susan Boylock here, which was with us talking about fuzzy trace theory and how to do a, a measurement of uh, patient preferences and that kind of decision making. So those are some of the um, things that go on. They, uh, uh, many, I think, know about peers. That is also through the CTSA, the uh, Training Interdisciplinary Emerging Research Scholars, that's a bi-monthly meeting of uh, and even some of the key level to meet here at the PCAMS. And we cover topics that are uh, more skill building. Um, we get sessions on project management, on uh, conflict resolution, um, trying to get to set up on negotiation skills, which is a really great speaker from uh, Canada. We can afford them, it's expensive. And, uh, uh, what are some of the other ones that are coming? Um, oh, Bob Rich is giving a great talk on uh, getting on transition. That, um, because people from business school will come over and talk about topics. Again, things that you don't get in med school or grad school that might be useful. So, any questions about uh, the broad area of health services outcomes research in terms of opportunities, things that uh, we should, things we should be doing that we're not doing here at UAB to help? I'll take some of these things. So, I'm obviously not done any work in this area at all, but I'm, I know there's a lot of effort in trying to make the electronic health record more valuable. It seems like there's a tension between um, making it too time intensive to yeah. put in all the data that you would like to have um, and making sure that you have data that's really important. Right. Is there, you didn't talk about it much as a tool. Yeah, right, do you right, see right. things moving in a direction? Yeah, right. Very actual actual question. Right. And there's you you may have noticed that all the examples I gave these data outside of our own health system. We historically have not been able to do a lot with our own health system data, in part because uh, the data is not structured enough and we don't capture the systematic enough way through the EHR. Uh, with Jim Smino being here and a greater focus on informatics and now a, a launching an IT media platform that uh, James Willig and Michael Rivero have started. I think it's going to get better and better and uh, the goal will be for us to be able to share our data and to merge our data with other data sources and to make it easier for investigators to answer questions using our data on both our EHR data and our administrative data combined. Now, the problem with EHR data is it's still about its input issue. So we come up with better standards for how we collect it. It's a little bit of a garbage in, garbage out issue. And without natural language processing, you don't get a lot of granularity out of uh, some of the things that we capture. But being able to access pharmacy data more reliably, we need to uh, some of the uh, prescription pharmacy services that, that some of that's accessible already. I think it's going to continue to improve, but it's still a ways to go. All right, well, thanks again. Great. So, um, let me remind you as you leave, um, please sign up for times for doing your oral presentations. So we only do six in the session, so um, if you're not in control, you can your account of the time options. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs>